Uh, let's give it another minute. Anything um, interesting in the news of biology or anything that people want to talk about? Let's start that off before we get started here. So, most uh, the most interesting thing I read about in the last couple of you know days about bio, you know genomics and things like that that was interesting was it people s that, that there was a paper published now about something that would reverse aging in mice. Okay, and if anybody saw that or heard, okay, what? Okay, slash dot. Okay, yeah. So, so this this is now a very interesting thing because obviously, you guys are not yet old enough. But when you get to my age, reversing aging starts to be a good thing. Um, and you know, so what what was this all about? Just from a point of view that's kind of that, of the basic science is that. Um, one thing that is on the, uh, we talk about genomic DNA in here a lot. Um, we don't talk so much about the fact that it's organized in chromosomes, these sort of hunks of, you know, there's 23 pairs. At the end of the pairs, there is a, um, a region that's a relatively boring sequence-wise region called the telomere. And um, what happens is, Every time the cell divides, essentially it tends to it, 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 it shortens this telomeric se sequence. And when you run out of the telomeric sequence, the cells can't divide anymore. And that's why you can have your cells divide a certain number of generations and then stop divide you know, and then you know the cells can't do it anymore. And um, so what this particular issue was there was a dr a drug that was proposed basically to grow the telomeres longer, okay? That's basically what, what I interpret as what was happening here. And they found that when they had these synthetically old mice, okay, um, they, you know, they gave them uh, a treatment to lengthen their telomeres, suddenly they got livelier and uh, did all kinds of good things, okay? So this is exciting and interesting because obviously an anti-aging thing would be interesting. Um, the, the, the fear is, though, that why is it that nature might have evolved a mechanism why they don't want cells to divide too many times? Can anybody figure out what that would be? Yeah? Like cancer. So, so cells accumulate mutations, okay? You know, as time goes by, there's going to be mutations accumulating. You would like, eventually, cells to, you know, if they're going to reproduce too often, you'd like them to die off, to, to, to to, to die. And so the fear would be that this is going to lead, if you provide a treatment to lengthen the telomeres, okay, you will end up promoting cancer, okay, it's going to work, you know, in the opposite direction there. But that's kind of the interesting news of the, of, of the week. Any other interesting news of the week? Okay, the interesting, the rest of the interesting news for the week concerns uh, the two special things that are going to happen next class. Um, which I want to discuss. The first is that next class we're not meeting here. We are going to be meeting in the life science build in the lobby of the life science building for your lab tour. Okay, we've talked here about that there are things called biologists and they have labs. Okay, but um, to make it more concrete, it's it's fun. We're going to visit the lab of Bruce Butcher, who's a very good yeast biologist here, who does a lot of interesting genomic stuff with microarrays and other things. And so I am encouraging every, everybody should show up, not here, but at class time in the lobby of the Life Science Building, okay? I will not be here, but uh, Paulina, will, Paulina and my, tea, my, my um, postdoc Charles will be there to corral you, okay? So you have to behave yourselves, okay? Um, and you wait quietly in the lobby of the Life Sciences Building at 350, and you will eventually be admitted up to the lab, okay? Any questions? about that. So what do I encourage you to do? First of all, as far as how you behave, okay? There's no eating or drinking, okay? They have toxic stuff there. They have, you don't want to eat or drink, you know, don't eat or drink anything there. Um, you know, I encourage you to all to ask questions about what kind of, you know, what, 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 what the different machines are doing, okay? So, so what is that? That thing's spinning. What is it, okay? Why is it spinning is a good question. Um, what is that thing that looks like a refrigerator, okay? Um, you know, I, I encourage you to just look around and ask questions about whatever 
things interest you? How much does that cost? Okay, is an interesting question. I find an interesting question. Um, you know, he will hopefully explain some of the science. It's, it's good. A, a, a perfectly fine question is what do you do? What, what, what is scientifically interesting to you? But I encourage you to sort of try to get a feeling for what these people do, what kind of equipment they have, why they have it. You will see PCR machines. Maybe ask, what is a PCR machine? I heard about PCR. Okay? Ask to see his elutriator. Okay? He's proud of his elutriator. Okay? Um, and you can ask him to explain what an elutriator is. Okay? Any questions about uh, what you should do or how you should do it? You behave quietly, politely and you say thank you at the end of the tour. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Anything, um, any other questions about the tour? Okay, so you will meet in the lobby of the Life Sciences Building. Okay. And um, anything else you think you might want to, yeah, I encourage people asking sort of polite but, but crazy questions. Anything you think that these people should want to ask or know or find interesting in a lab tour? You, I'm looking at you as a representative of yeast biology like thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a microscope. What, what, what are you looking at in the microscope is a good question. Maybe they'll let you look through it, okay? And, and stuff like this, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, people have usually found this to be an entertaining experience. Okay, any questions? No one's broken anything yet, so be careful walking around, though. Okay, it gets narrow, there's stuff there to do. Any questions? Okay, the other thing you will do at the beginning of the lab tour is turn in to Paulina your homework three, okay? which was, again, I don't want you to spend more than three hours on it, but it basically was a cluster, a problem where you're doing, I want you to do, have a data set, I want you to do some clustering, and I want you to do some phylogenic tree reconstruction. We'll talk about phylogenic trees today. But basically, I want you to play with these packages. Has anyone gotten started on that? Okay, any, any issues come up that were surprising or uh, difficult? To how do you judge what a good clustering is? Okay, so the data set, okay, so one question is how do you decide if a good clustering, what a good clustering is? The data set, as I recall, is about different animal species. Is that correct? What? Okay, different cancer types. Okay, right, okay, right. So we, we'd, we'd worked out a couple of different exercises right, at, at different points. All right. So in that particular thing, there was a data set of microarray data there were set from seven different types of tissues, right? So it would seem to me that a good clustering would be one where within each cluster it is relatively pure. You'd like to say that, that, that there were seven different tissue types. In an ideal world, what you would find is when you clustered the microarray data, you could discover what tissue type it was because or they formed seven clusters and each one was like that. That to me is, I guess, the platonic ideal of what the clustering should be. Undoubtedly, you will not completely get that, but that's kind of what the idea is. Yeah. For example, uh, in gaming, if I use all the different, different functions, uh, all of them are, they, they look bad to me. I don't know which one is better than others. Okay. So, so the question you're saying is you tried a lot of distance functions, they all look bad to you. Okay. And one question is to qualify maybe what bad is. Maybe to use a smaller number. Now, how many clusters did you use? Uh, ten. ten. Okay. Well, now maybe the answer is seven, since there really are seven types. Or maybe the interesting question is two, and see wh how many of them the clusters aren't pure. Okay. Basically, I want you to play with it to get some sense as to how things vary and how things don't vary. Okay. So the, the best one would be, in principle. One where you came out with seven clusters, each of which was ideally pure. Okay? Now, the likelihood that you will do that is probably very small. Okay? But I think that getting a sense as to what you can hope to recover from this, what you can hope not to recover from this, is really what I'm trying to get your sense of it. So hopefully clustering will reveal some order. You will look at this thing and say, yeah, you know, the clusters do look like they're largely coherent. Okay? You will also reveal the limits that, of course, they're, you know, they're not going to be perfectly coherent, okay? And, you know, I encourage you to play with that. That's the other one. The second data set is on animal species, correct? And this is one that you should have some intuitive sense. It's something you're going to be getting up groupings here. 
You, I suspect, everybody here has watched enough television shows with wildlife in it that you have some kind of a sense that an elephant and a mouse are probably not as similar as an elephant and a rhino, okay? And the question really is, to what extent do you recover things that, are, that, that match your intuition of how phylogeny should fit? That's kind of, I guess, what I'm hoping to happen here, okay? And um, see how it varies. See, see the topology of the tree. Is it long and skinny? Is it deep? As you vary different kinds of you know, criteria and, and algorithms. Any questions? So basically, I encourage you to play to see what you can figure out, what you can't figure out. If you come back and write your report saying they're all lousy, then you learn something, okay? About the limitations of these things. Any questions? Okay? And again, you know, you decide how, how far you can go on this kind of thing. It may be one way you would make it better. Anyway, I don't, I don't want you to get to go too crazy, perhaps re restricting the, the feature set. Okay, doing some analysis to eliminate the less meaningful features or something, or identify what they are or something like this. Maybe a meaningful thing. But basically, I want you to play around with a little bit, write a little report, and turn it in when you come to the, uh, the, the class tour on, um, on Thursday. Any questions? So it's the same time as class. It's in the Life Sciences Building Lobby. Life Sciences. And this is the building, the, a building right next to computer science, for those of you who have not seen this. Anybody who doesn't know where Life Sciences Building is? Okay, you don't, you don't know. Okay, so the way I think of it is, here is computer science. It is sort of like this. There is sort of Javits here, right? This is my office. Um, as you go around, uh, okay, up here you will walk up a slight hill. Is that right? And on the slight hill here you will see the old life sciences library which is a low building, which is becoming the Laufer Center for Quantitative Biology. And here you will see, a, coming up here, a six-story-ish brick building called the Life Sciences Building. You will go in here. You will wait in the lobby here at a coffee um, stand. You do not buy anything because you don't eat or drink in the lab. Is that understood? You wait here politely, look for your other classmates, and get up there. Any questions? Any questions about the homework or the uh, lab tour? Okay, good. So what I wanted to talk about today, what is the shift gears to the last, let's say, topic of interest in the course for the semester? I wanted to talk a little bit about reconstructing phylogenic trees. Um, um, and the, the, the basic source of the problem comes from that whenever you have an evolutionary process, okay, you typically start out with one initial population, okay, and there are speciation events, okay, a speciation event, as far as I'm concerned, is the population splits in some way, okay, some variant of the initial population springs up, springs up and the two populations basically become separate and disjoint. Okay, a typical speciation event might be that uh, you know let let's say let's say a world where you have I'm just going to again make this thing up but let's say that we have a world where there is uh, you know two a mountain range here okay you have uh, critters you know living on these mountains a flood comes along and suddenly these mountains become islands. Now these populations are separate, okay? Originally you had chipmunks, okay? There were chipmunks on this mountain, chipmunks on this mountain. They look the same, you know, they're, they're the same. Something comes along to separate them. Over a long period of time, there's going to be changes, adaptations. These things are going to bifurcate. Over time, you will get two species, neither of which are chipmunks, okay, but which are variants, okay, and that is what I consider to be a typical example of how a speciation event might happen. The population splits, you know, mutation, natural, natural selection, all these things happen. Over time, there's going to be drift between the two populations, and if you come back far enough in the future, the things that look like chipmunks here are no longer going to be identical to the chipmunks that are there, okay. 
Any questions about that? Okay, actually, this is, you know, that may not have been the best explanation. But the basic view is that, that there are speciation events that create populations that split, they go about their business. Um, eventually, the, the, the populations are different enough that you would cause to call them, you know, distinct species. Okay, historically, I guess the definition of species has been that, that, that they can't breed together. Okay, if an element from this population couldn't breed with another population like that. But basically, they're different enough. And then over time, there will be a variety of different bifurcation events. Okay? And at the end, in the current world, you have a certain number of species. Okay? And the goal of a, phylo a phylogenetic tree explains where these species came up from. Okay? The common ancestor that separated birds from reptiles, according to this tree, split off longer ago than the thing that evolved between the different mammals. The common ancestor between humans and mouse were further back in history than the common ancestor between humans and gorillas. Okay? I would say maybe humans and gorillas shared a common ancestor five million years ago. Okay? And humans and mice shared a common ancestor maybe a hundred million years ago. Okay? And maybe we shared a, a, the, the last common ancestor between us and the you know, bird slash reptile thing maybe was 300 million years ago. Okay? I'm making up these numbers now. But basically there were certain, certain bifurcations of the population. The phylogenetic tree problem is given what we know about today, try to figure out what that tree was that created these, you know, that, 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 that the tree that of, of speciation events that led to this result. Any questions about that? What we mean by this. Okay. Any questions about what we mean by a phylogenetic tree? Okay. Good. So the, you know, so again, why do people want to reconstruct phylogenetic trees? Okay. Part of it is that, so I mean, again, the, the computational problem, as I've stated, is given the properties of the leaf nodes, okay, the species around today, okay, reconstruct the history of what the tree was, okay. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people care about this kind of thing, okay. Part of it is just basic science. It is important to understand how the world evolved, okay. And I think that's sort of on a, just a basic science level. To me, that's an obvious reason why people could care about it. There are certain medical issues here that become important. Okay? So, for example, um, you know, with viruses, okay, if you take a look at like HIV, there is a question of where HIV is a virus. Okay, you've all heard of HIV and AIDS. Okay, it's a virus. HIV is a virus that causes AIDS. There is a question of where did it come from? You know, somehow. You know, there was a point in, in history, like in the, I guess it was the late 70s or so, when it suddenly came to, con you know, consciousness it was a disease-causing agent. Where did it come from before is a perfectly reasonable thing. So just like there are phylogenic trees on, you know, big animals, there's no reason why you don't have phylogenic trees on viruses. Each virus would represent a leaf node, okay? Viral sequences had a common ancestor. They evolved, okay? And understanding how these things evolved is kind of important, okay? Because there are different subpopulations. There, there are, you know, as I understand it, you know, there's, you know, a bunch of different subpopulations of HIV, okay? And that they have different disease phenotypes. How they evolved, how rapidly they evolved, these become interesting things. Any questions about that? There are other issues just about sort of evolution. Like there's concern, you know, one question that people have wondered about, you know, historically is how did humans evolve, okay? And we have a world where, you know, if you look at, let's say, human ancestry, if you go to like, the Museum of Natural History in New York, there's a room on human, a special exhibit, a wonderful exhibit on human, the whole human origins. And you can see fossils of all different kinds of species of, you know, pre-human um, you know, 
your hominids, okay, human-like species, okay? And the question of how these things, you know, what we evolved from becomes an interesting question. One recently interesting question was to what extent there was an ancient type of human, Neanderthal man. I assume everybody I have this image of caveman, you know, Neanderthal man, okay? And the question is, to what extent are we related to caveman, you know, Neanderthal man today? There is a modern man, there is Neanderthal man. Okay, and exactly what is the evolutionary relationship with them? When was there a common ancestor? Was there intermixing between these? These are interesting kinds of species, questions. And understanding this is important. Any questions about that? The other thing to note is that, um, that phylogenetic trees are useful in thinking about uh, lots of other things beyond just biology. So, um, I mean, the, bio the biological need for study, reconstructing phylogeny is the most important application. But there are other things in life that, that, that we deal with in the world that evolved from some kind of, um, through some kind of process. Pro one of the, one of the, 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 probably the most prominent other one is languages. Everybody here, you know, you know, er you know everyone knows there is English, there is French, there is Spanish. There is Basque, okay, there is you know, all these different, in Chinese, there's all kinds of different languages. And the question of how is it that these languages evolved, okay, is very much a, um, you know, a evolutionary process, the same way that that, that is with life, you know, life thing. How is it that languages evolved? To a certain extent, a bunch of people moved over to some place, okay? They, they moved over someplace, they were cut off from the original population, right? Now, um, these people started talking among themselves, and they had to name new things, and they were only talking among themselves. So you would expect that at the beginning, someone from this group could talk to someone from this group, okay? But over time, you know, as they come up with new words, as they talk to each other, there is drift. Eventually, new languages and dialects emerge. And trying to reconstruct what the history of these languages is, is an interesting problem. Does everybody kind of understand that? Yeah. Okay, so what are the intermediate nodes in a, uh, a phylogenetic tree? The way I would think about them are, it is a population about to undergo a split. That is what I interpret a... a uh, a, what are these intermediate nodes, okay? So in the case of languages, if we have a world where, let's, let's say like, okay, so for example, North America, as I understood, got um, first inhabited about 12,000 years ago from people who walked across Alaska, the Bering Strait in Alaska, right? These guys wander around, they were talking to each other, no doubt, okay? Talk to each other in Russian or something like, not Russian, but some some language, right? They then, a bunch of them cross the, uh, cross the land bridge. They, then the land bridge goes away. These people are not coming back, right? These populations are now going to be separate populations. They're going to evolve new things, right? When they got over to the new side, they discovered new things. What's this? Oh, we'll call it a bear, a polar bear, okay? And what I picture the intermediate nodes are, are speciation events. Essentially, the event that, that a population crossed here and never went back, right? And then what is happening, I picture the edges as being the flow of time by which these processes are going to end up leading to distinct things, right? Yes? The intermediate nodes are, as far as I'm concerned, population, you know, I think of them as populations, okay? And you're saying, are they species that don't exist anymore? The answer is m maybe, probably, usually, but I would say not always, okay? There is no law that says that um, if we think about this, this language split, just because um, a group of people crossed over this language barrier, right? Maybe that, 
these people's world changed. Their languages probably changed. It's not obvious that the original population's language changes as a result of this. Does that make sense? So you could imagine a world where the population splits and one of them evolves. One of them has a different environment and so changes. But the population itself did not necessarily die out, right? It continues to live and, and, and thrive there, right? But that's still considered on the leaf node, not in the spring. Well, the leaf node, the way I think of it is, the leaf nodes are species. The inner nodes are populations, okay? And the likely explanation that I would say is that since this period in time, both populations have drifted, okay? But I don't see any reason why it has to be that. It has to be something that caused one subpopulation to branch off and become successful. So like, for example, let's say we wanted to take a look at the, um, let's make the phylog phylogenetic history of different computer science disciplines, okay? There are programming language people, there are algorithms people, there are computational biologists, right? There was a period in time where there was a prototype community and computational biologists split off from them. Does that make sense? It's not clear that the species here was any different than current algorithms people. Does that kind of make sense? You could kind of imagine that the computational biologists split off, got interested in other things. At one point, they were close enough they could mate with algorithms people. Okay, but over time they evolved different cultures, they evolved different conferences, right? And now these people are clearly distinguishable from them. The original population didn't necessarily change, right? But something branched off from it. So that's what I picture the intermediate nodes are, okay? Any questions? Okay, so you're saying there is another process here of something that evolves by an evolutionary process, which is source code, you know, programs. Say in the beginning, and this is a classic example, there was Unix from AT&T Bell Labs, right? In the beginning, Richie and Thompson developed a Unix version, right? And then they gave it version of it to somebody else, and these people said, wait a second, I'm going to modify it because I want something different, right? Somebody else pirated their version, and then there was a, a split, right? And today there is an infinite number of different ver you know, versions of Unix, right? They all trace back to a common ancestor, but there is a history of splitting, okay? And if you have had a history of splitting, you have a similar process here that is undergoing with any speciation event. The speciation event is one group decided, I don't like I want to do something different with this Unix, right? And I split it off. Any questions? In that case, it, it's, it's obvious that, that there is no reason why both groups ha sides have to change, right? They could have a, a you know, canonical version of this thing, and somebody else decides, no, I want it to be different, okay? And so there's active development on that side, but it's a dead product on, on the other side. Right? Yeah. Okay, I, an intermediate node is going to be a population, in, in the case of, a, of, of species, is a population of things that can breed with each other. That's what I am picturing an intermediate node is. Okay? Now the thing is, it's not clear that it's a species, that that species is any different than the species that you see now, right? Okay, so it could be the case that the species, uh, you know, that you now have here, that there is a, you know, humans and chimps. It could be that our ancestor was neither human or chimp, okay? And that it was, you know, it was, you know, something in between, okay? And that's maybe what I, that's maybe the default way to think about it, okay? But recognize that there's nothing fundamental that says these guys can't be alive today, 
Okay? It's just a, 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 a current population. Any questions about that or comments? Uh, uh, yeah. Comment about the birds. Uh, all the different kinds of pigeons and doves are supposed to be divert from the rock pigeons that we see uh, in urban cities. So all the doves and uh, pigeons, they branched off somewhere some millions of years ago from, some thousands of years ago from the rock pigeons. You see rock pigeons everywhere today, you see... Rock pigeons, rock pigeons. Yes. Okay? So what he's saying is that there is a population of, you know, of, of pigeons that he cared, okay, and that, that, that over time there was a split, okay, and that there was some group of pigeons that, that stayed looking like pigeons. That, that, that basically the pigeons today look a, a lot like the pigeons yeah, at, of, of, a, of a few million years ago. But there's other subpopulations that split off, okay? Any questions? Okay. So there's lots of different phenomena that get explained by these tree light bifurcations, okay? Um, languages, I think I've told you about, are, 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 quite are, you know, are quite convincing, okay? I think everybody has this idea that you know, how language groups split off, and there's a tremendous amount of study of this kind of thing. One interesting application of phylogenetic trees that I heard from were chain letters on the web, okay? So, uh, Everybody, has ever, any, how many people have gotten letters of the four by email? Um, oh, you know, um, you know, uh, you, you know, if, if this is a letter, this letter, if you, if you don't forward it to somebody, this third letter, something bad is going to happen, right? Okay, there was somebody who, uh, you know, the last person who didn't forward it left, and then, then a piano fell on him as he walked out of the room, right? <laughs> Send this to your five people, people and everything's going to be fine. How many people have seen these letters? Okay, everybody. Now, what uh, one person who studies sort of you know, uh, phylogenetic tree algorithms did um, was take a look at a large number of different chain letters that were circulating on the web and built using the same kind of phylogenetic tree reconstruction algorithms, built an evolutionary history of these chain letter algorithms. There was one person on the web at one point who said, I am going to start one of these things, okay? And he had the line in there about the piano falling on your head. But somewhere along the line, somebody changed it, right? They may have said, send it to six of your people instead of five people, right? And now the letter is changed. And then somewhere along the line, it accumulates other changes, right? And the claim would be, but with a similar kind of algorithm, you want to reconstruct the history of chain letters in the world. The leaf nodes are all existing, circulating chain letters, right? The question is, no one wrote the chain letter from scratch, okay? The claim is this is a speciation event. You can reconstruct the history of it. And for those of you who are not listening and have the computers out, you can Google history of chain letters and phylogeny of chain letters. You could probably find his website there. Any questions? Another one I heard about that I really liked was in, that people who study medieval manuscripts, okay, build phylogenetic trees on these things. Why is this? You know, that in the Middle Ages, there were these monks who sat there and recopied the Bible all day, right? Apparently, a large number of these monks were illiterate, okay? They couldn't actually read it. They were copying it, right? If I had to copy something in Chinese in principle, I could, you know, if you make me, I could copy Chinese, right? But I wouldn't recognize it if I made a spelling mistake, right? And so the next person who copies my Bible with the spelling mistake would make the same spelling mistake. Does everybody get that idea? They accumulate these mutations. And so people who care about medieval manuscripts will want to reconstruct the history of who copied what from where. The current leaf nodes are the bare, you know, the existing texts, okay? And the question is, who copied what from what? This is a question of speciation. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, in the manuscript example, uh, I think the ordering is very clear that the correct text occurred before the, before the text of the mistake. How do you decide the ordering in other applications? Like so you're saying, okay, so you're saying that if you wanted to build this tray, you think that you could do it in the case of the manuscripts by simply looking at the accumulated spelling mistakes, right? And that, w and that you're saying that strictly you're saying that the more spelling mistakes, if, if I have a superset of spelling mistakes of yours, then I, you were copied from me, okay? That's, that seems like a reasonable thing. We're going to talk, in a few minutes, start to talk about how you do these trees. 
what the underlying data is. Okay, I think it's really what your question is. How do you hope to build these trees? And that's why we're going to talk about phylogenetic tree algorithms for the next couple of classes. Yes? How would you determine who made the mistakes? How would you determine who made the mistakes? Well, okay, I guess the point is now we read it. Now we read it. What? Point of reference. In other words, if you, depending on which one you look at first, you can say that, you know, okay, this one must have copied that one and made these mistakes. But if you're looking at the other one, you can say that, the, you know, the second one. If you had a copyist, what you're saying, if you had one copyist who was perfect, okay, you couldn't tell if the copy was before the original. That's true. What he's saying, though, is if I have a world where, let's say that, uh, you know, the cat in the hat is the original biblical verse, okay? The cat in the hat, okay? And then somebody comes along and writes the cat in the hat, right? And then somebody else comes along and writes, makes another spelling mistake, the cat in the bat, okay? What he's arguing is, that this one had to be first because this has one error, okay, that was in both of them. This one has an error that is in only one of them, right? That's the argument that you're trying to make, okay? Anyway, the, the point is that there is an evolutionary process. It should be clear that there is an evolutionary process. In principle, the evidence is before us. The algorithmic problem is given evidence about the current state. The understanding that there was a, um, you know, a evolutionary process, a bifurcation process. What is the best tree to explain it? That is the well-defined algorithm problem. Yes. Okay. What you're saying that is now an important, an important thing is. Is it clear that the thing is a tree at all? Okay? So suppose, let's say, that our monk sat there with not one copy of the, of the Bible in front of them, but he had two copies, right? Or maybe they trade off their copies from once in a while. That might be a good example, right? Every day the monks, they have a, a set of Bibles sitting in, in a stack, right? And the monks come to work, and they pick one from the stack, right? Now I'm not descended from one node, right? I'm really descended from multiple nodes. And in that case, my evolutionary process is no longer a tree. Does everybody kind of get that idea? That's an important point. If we have a world where, you know, here we have a tree, everybody has a unique parent, right? But if we have a world like this, where, I'm, where I am descended from two different nodes, then it is no longer a tree, okay? And that makes the nature of the problems quite different, okay? So this is actually an important point. In what we're going to talk about today, and for this section, we're going to say, darn it, it's a tree, okay? And that trees are, trees have lots of nice properties to them. What are one pro trees don't have cycles in them, right? That's what a tree really has, okay? And we'll see that, that it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to come up with these algorithms and reconstruction things for the simpler model of the trees. Now, in a lot of cases, trees are accurate models, okay? But they're not perfect models, okay? We can kind of picture that um, with respect to species, big animal species, I think we would probably agree as it, it probably is a very good model, right? that we don't kind of imagine that at some point, you know, we originally have a, a common population of, you know, the common ancestor of uh, elephants and rhinos and stuff. We don't picture them having mated with a mouse anywhere along the line, right? On the other hand, when it comes to bacteria, for example, bacterial species are species, okay? Reconstructing the history of bacterial species is extremely interesting, just as it's important as reconstructing anything else. It is the case that people have discovered that it is not the case that a tree perfectly explains evolution in bacterial species. There is something called lateral transfer, where genes will sometimes move from one species to someplace else across the tree, that you have somehow bacterial genomes will sometimes get fused between species. 
Okay? So the bottom line is, yes, non-free topologies can happen, okay? Because anything can happen in biology, right? But the tree model is an interesting model, and that's what we're going to limit our attention to. Any questions about it? Okay, yes? I'm still unclear with how you could be so sure that the first one is the... Well, we know, we know that, let's say, that the first Bible was written by someone who knew how to spell. That seems like an assumption. So the person who knew how to spell got it right first. Well, my, my point is, how do you know what is the correct spelling? Okay, how is, what is the correct spelling? For certain words, I don't know the correct spelling. No, but what okay. I'm saying is, it's all based upon someone that decided something long ago. Oh, okay, you're saying, how is it, like, like, like Shakespeare, you know, spelled properly, right? He was a good writer, he must have been able to spell, but his spellings are quite different than ours. That's because spelling also evolves, okay? And that might be another issue that you'd have to worry about here. But bottom line is the claim, okay, so the important point is that in these models, what we have are a set of leaves, which are species of which we have data about. We believe that there is a binary tree, a file, a, a, an evolutionary tree that is governing, okay, what their, you know, their speciation process is. And our job is to reconstruct that tree, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, we agree the tree is, is not a perfect, perfect thing, but a tree is a good model, okay? An important model, and we have to deal with trees. Yes? Okay, so you're saying that in the case of uh, the Bible one, we know what the right answer was, the right answer was at the root. If we're dealing with sequence evolution, that's not true, right? <coughs> Let's think about what we know. Okay. What is the data, I think, the next question is? What data do we have to build trees from? That's really the first question that I'll say we're going to want to ask. I think that when we talk about sequence data, this will become clearer, okay? The claim is that when we think about building phylogenic trees, there are two types of data that we are going to, two classes of data that uh, we will talk about that require quite different algorithms to work with. So there are different flavors of algorithms depending on what flavor of data you're given. Um, the first is what I will call a distance data, okay? Where what I am given as input is, if I have n species, I am given an n by n matrix. And what I'm going to be told is, the value ij is going to tell me what is the distance in terms of evolutionary distance between the i species and the j species, okay? That would be a distance data, okay? Now, where might I get distance data from, um, if we think about it? Distance data might be, in the case of genomic sequences, might be a question of edit distance, okay? Let's say that I took a look at the... Um, you know, a, a, I have a set of very important genes that are conserved, that are all appear in a set of species, okay? So here I've got a set of species, let's say n species. For each of these three genes, I have what that gene is in each one of the species. I compute a distance measure between the ith Set of, set of sequences and the jth set of sequences. Perhaps I use edit distance to do this, right? If the species are similar, okay, we would expect the edit distance to be small between them, okay? If the species were separated a long time ago, the edit distance between the sequences should be larger. What I claim is I can use this distance to define a distance between those species. Any questions about that? I said that with some presumption, but I didn't get the sense every, everybody understood what I was saying. Okay? So, in a distance data problem, I am going to be getting some data that for every pair of species measures how far apart they are. In the case of sequences, I think edit distance is a good e proxy for that, right? If the species are the same, the edit distance is zero. Right? Species separated billions of years ago, okay? The edit distance is going to be relatively large. So in this case, I can use 
the distance between DNA sequences as a proxy for how long ago they separated. Okay? And that's the idea of how we can go from DNA sequences to distances. Any questions? Now, there's a question that's going to come up as to whether I can interpret the distance between DNA sequences as just being a distance, or if I can compute that, convert that to time of separation. So let's picture the following. Suppose we look at an evolutionary tree again. Here we've got three species, right? And if we look at, let's say, how their genomic sequences have evolved, right? We could imagine that there's going to be a distance between A and B, and a distance between any pair, uh, all three of the pairs here, right? We have a sense that the edit distance between A and B is going to be smaller than the distance between A and C and B and C. Does everybody get that idea? Okay. That gives us a fair distance idea that says that these two probably split off more recently because the distance here is relatively small, right? There's a separate question we might hope to be true, which is something like this. Suppose that the distance, but that, that the edit distance from here to here was, um, let's say, 10 mutations, okay? And the edit distance from A to C was 20 mutations, okay? There's a question, are we safe in assuming that the split off here happened twice as far ago as the split off here? Does everybody get that idea? If we assume the mutations get accumulated at a certain number of mutations per million years, right? The claim would be that we could not, by looking at the edit distance between the two, we could by that figure out how long ago they mutated. They differed. Does everybody get that idea? If we assume that there is a constant molecular clock, okay, that governs how fast these things accumulate, you might get more than distance. You might get an dis interpretation of distance as time. Does everybody get that idea? Now, it's not clear that there always is a molecular clock like this. Okay? The number of mutations that accumulate have to do with how rapidly the environment changes. Does everybody get that idea? If I put you guys in a nice, comfortable environment, okay, and I promise to feed you, I promise to do something, nothing of you will change 70 years from now, right? On the other hand, if I throw you out in the streets, okay, rapidly, you, things are going to change. Does everybody get that idea? So in interpreting this DNA distance data, okay, it's clear, I think, from the edit distance that we can interpret it as a distance, okay? We might think we can interpret it as a n time in terms of millions of years ago, but that's a somewhat dicier assumption. Any questions about that? Okay, but bottom line, distance data is one of the things we might want to build um, uh, our algorithms to deal with. Okay, any questions? The other question we might want to talk bit use is something called feature data. Okay, where instead of a matrix, that is the number of species by the number of species, it is a matrix that is the number of species by the number of features you can identify on that species. Okay? So, for example, every animal has a certain number of properties to it, right? We take a look at an elephant. What do we know about an elephant? It has a trunk, right? It has four legs. It has tusks. Okay? It doesn't fly. There's a set of features you can list out about an elephant, right? And you could now picture a matrix where every species is a row, and we get a for uh, the ijth entry in this matrix is whether or not the ith species has feature j, okay? And that, I claim, is a different set of type of data, okay? And it's a perfectly reasonable thing to try to reconstruct things from, okay? And the claim that I'll talk about is that there's two classes 
systems you might work with, okay? Depending upon whether you're working with distance data or feature data. Any questions about that? Yeah. Right, so the argument here is, what is this case about feature data? If we have two nearby species, the argument is that probably they share a lot of features in common. That's certainly one thing that we would expect, right? And we could convert that into a distance measure, right? How many features do we have in common? But maybe there's reasons why inter leaving interpreting it as a feature data might be more interesting. Because, for example, suppose these features were things that were hard to evolve, okay? Let's say, like, had an eye. I could see light, right? That is probably something that was hard to evolve. And the species that, that have the ability to, to, to see, okay, probably are all descendant from one, one ancestor population which suddenly dis evolved a prototype eye. Does everybody get that idea? That is a different situation than just saying that all these guys share a lot of features, right? It's saying that if certain features are hard to evolve, we want a tree that will explain the history without having to reinvent these features very much. Does that make sense? And so that's why if you have feature data, it might be more sensible to talk about it and interpret it as feature data rather than just computing a distance matrix on it, okay? It should be clear, given any two vectors of features, you can construct a distance matrix on it, right? So pretty much from any data, you should be able to construct some distance ma ma measure, right? But the claim is that for certain applications, you may have feature data, and that is a stronger thing potentially to work with. Any questions? Okay. So what would be a case of feature data? Well, 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 let's just think for our applications here. If we were trying to reconstruct medieval manuscripts, what would we want to use, distance or feature data? And what might be the data that we would want to use for, for the medieval manuscript case? Distance. You say distance, take these two Bibles and do an edit distance on them. Maybe. But actually, I think that the feature data is more appropriate here, right? It's going to be a question of, I probably have for every feature would be, does it have this misspelling, right? If we look at this particular Bible, you know, the, the cat in the hat evolution, I would probably say I'd want one feature to be this column and another feature to be that column, right? It was hard to evolve this misspelling from a C to a K, right? But once it had it, all the descendants probably had that property to it, right? So note that in the case of the medieval manuscripts, interpreting it the way you wanted to interpret it, implicitly you were thinking about features rather than distance. Does that make sense? It's not the case that, you know, it's not the case that there'd be a, how many mistakes there are, but there's a question of whether they are conserved that starts to be interesting. It's hard to evolve a, a misspelling, okay? And so we would want the tree that causes the smallest number of total misspellings to evolve, okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions here? Yes. Well, so the question is now, what trees do you get, okay, from these things? And does it matter? Okay, my answer is that it is going to matter because there are a lot of different trees out there, okay? So the short answer is, does it matter what data you feed to it or what reconstruction algorithm you use? And the answer is yes, very much so, okay? And the reason is twofold. One is because there are, what are the, the fundamental reason? is that there are a huge number of possible trees. How many trees are there on n species? Let's think about this. That's what I'd like to now talk about. My claim is if you have 10 n, n leaves, okay, which are your base species, 
There are a huge number of trees you might build on your end leaves. How many? I claim we can count it fairly easily using two different observations. Okay, so let's think a little combinatorics for a minute. My claim is that we're going to look at two different kinds of trees. I'll claim that there's two different kinds of trees that you know people can talk about. One that we're going to talk about are rooted. Okay, are um, rooted binary trees. Okay, so what is a rooted binary tree? We have a notion of there being a root and oldest species, right? A point at which there were speciation events. This is what a rooted binary tree looks like on n species, right? And there might be other, in this case there were eight species. There might be other trees that could be split off from this, like maybe this species survived un unchanged. Here we've got six, that's five, six, seven, eight. There's another tree, right? This is a rooted tree. We could also talk about unrooted binary trees. Yes? The question is, does a binary, does everyone's speciation event have to be binary? My argument would be, you know, again, nothing is necessarily always true. You could imagine the, pop, uh, the, the chipmunk population at one point made a deal to split between three different mountains, right? And they said, you guys go there, we go, now we're in three different mountains, right? But that's relatively unlikely, right? And you could view it as being saying, well, maybe it was two binary splits, right? The act of saying, you chipmunks, go to that mountain. That was a first binary split, followed by another binary split, right? So you don't lose much of anything thinking about these as binary trees, okay? Although that's an argument that speciation events that happen very close to each other exactly what the ordering is is going to be hard to figure out. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So how many trees are there? I claim every binary tree, if it has n leaves, it's going to have n minus 1 internal nodes. What's the proof? Here you have 8 leaves. Here you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay? n minus 1 internal nodes. Okay? How many edges are there? Well, the claim is that there's going to be n leaves plus n internal nodes, a total of 2n plus minus 1 vertices. The number of edges you get is 1 less than the number of vertices. Now, why is that? Again, it's kind of a, 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 if you look at it by an inductive argument. If you have one node, you have zero leaves, edges. Is that right? You have two nodes, you have one edge, right? If every time you add a, a node, you have to add an edge, you get one less edge than you have nodes. Okay, and that's the argument why that many edges have to be there. Any questions? So we know a rooted binary tree has this many end leaves, this many internal nodes, this many edges. If we have an unrooted binary tree, the claim is that if you've got n leaves, okay, the claim is that you've got one less vertex than, um, than before. Because the root that you've got on a binary tree, if you look at, if you look at a binary tree, note that the, what makes the root special? The root has two guys coming out of it and nobody going into it. Does everybody see that? Every other node in the tree, you know, every inter internal, every other internal node, has the property that it's got two guys coming out of it and one parent going into it, right? If you talk about an unrooted binary tree, here is an unrooted binary tree with n leaves. Let me actually split it like this. Does everybody see this? Here is an unrooted tree. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six leaves. It's got one, two, three, four. What happened here? What? Did I have any node that's weird here? Let me think about this. 
here I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six leaves, right? And I have how many internal nodes? One, two, three, four. What? One, two, three, four. What happened? Before I would have had n minus one, now I have n minus two of them, right? Because you don't see a root here. Okay, the root really, we can think of the root as two going out. We could sort of replace that by just an edge and get rid of the root. And that's kind of what the difference is in an unrooted tree. Any questions about that? So how can we use these definitions to count? My claim is, and here's again an example of something. Here we've got a rooted tree, okay, which has a total of n nodes. This is rooted. Here is an unrooted tree with, uh, with uh, eight nodes. We got rid of the root by just connecting seven and eight directly. Does everybody see that given a rooted tree, I can construct an unrooted tree from it with one less vertex? Any questions? Yeah. No, because it's a tree. I'm getting rid of this thing. So, what do you mean by a directed graph? Okay. No, the way to interpret this thing, I'm interpreting this as a rooted tree where this is the root. Okay? And if we think about what a rooted tree is, if I compare the difference between a rooted tree and an unrooted tree, pick up the root. Think of these things as being connected by rope. The edges are rope, right? If I pick up the root and hold the, the rope up high, from the, 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 the tree up high from the root, everybody else is going to hang down. Does everybody get that idea? So that's what a rooted tree is. A rooted tree is an unrooted tree with one node picked as the root that got hung up. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, say what you're doing? Okay, so you guys are thinking of rooted of binary search trees. You're a computer scientist. You're saying binary search trees. Search trees, there is a left pointer and a right pointer, right? Here, there is no notion of left and right. There is only a notion of ancestor, right? If you think about it, if a speciation, if there was an ancestor between the, you know, a common ancestor of the elephant and the hippo, which would go on the left? It doesn't, make any, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense in that context, right? So don't think of these as binary search trees. Think of them as binary trees. You can have an unrooted tree like this. You take, to root it, you take a vertex and lift it up, and it becomes a leaf, and it becomes a root, okay? Any, any vertex, any questions? Right, so seven and eight both share, uh, both have, a, uh, their, their ancestor is nine, right? But there's no notion of who came first, okay? Because it was a speciation event. They split. They split on equal terms, right? Any questions? Well, then how do you interpret that in the, un the unrooted? Okay, so here's what the thing is. There's this kind of confusing relationship between rooted trees and unrooted trees, Okay. What I want to show you is rooted trees and unrooted trees are very similar things, okay? What do I want to claim? I claim that if you give me a, um, what you call it, a, an unrooted tree, here is an unrooted tree, I claim I can make, okay, and it has a certain number of leaves. In this case, it has one, two, three, four, five leaves, right? I claim I could create a, um, what you call it? I could create many different rooted trees, okay, out of this tree, okay? By putting in a root, by picking an edge, let's say I pick this edge, 
and I divide the edge and I put in a vertex here. If I pick the tree up by that vertex, I'm going to get exactly this tree. Does everybody see this? If you look at 9, 9 is between eight, 7 and 8, right? To get this rooted tree, with that topology, I took this unrooted tree and I divided one of those edges and put it up there. Does everybody agree with that? That is an argument that there are 2n minus 1 unrooted tree, rooted trees for every unrooted tree. Okay? That is the first argument in counting. Yes? In terms of data structures, since left and right don't matter, you don't call them left and right. You call them first, you know, you call them first and second. You now have two pointers, but there's no notion of first or second. Maybe you sort them according to the lower vertex number to put it in a canonical way. Does everybody have that, get that idea? Every node can, has two pointers going out, okay? But we don't interpret them as being, you know, left and right. We interpret them as being, you know, first and second, okay? Which in this case, the way I would do it to make it canonically efficient, I would figure out, make the lower order number, the lower order child to be the left one, and the higher order one the right one. Okay? Does that answer your data structure question? How do I decide which one should be the left pointer and which should be the right pointer? Seven and eight have three pointers. Seven and eight have three pointers. The claim is in rooting the tray. I pick one node to be the root. That's on top, right? I take it, I lift it up. At this point, I've got two children who are equal, have equal ch claim on the throne, right? For canonical purposes, maybe I'll put the one with the lower number to the left, okay? Questions? So you're saying you never deal with it as an unrooted tree? Well, no, no, no. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to count the number of rooted trees. That's how many phylogenic trees there are, right? What I want to show you is that phylogenic, to count phylogenic rooted trees, you really need to be able to count unrooted trees, right? Because the number of rooted trees is 2n minus 3 times the number of unrooted trees, right? And on the other end, it's also the case that any rooted tree, okay, I can take any rooted tree on n leaves and convert it into an unrooted tree on n plus 1 leaves. What if I add, take the root, and I add another leaf here, okay? The root, if I have a rooted tree, the root is well defined. Does everybody agree with that? If I want to take a rooted tree and convert it to an unrooted tree, all I have to do is to add a leaf off the root, okay? And if you believe that, then the number of rooted trees on end leaves is the same as the number of unrooted trees on n minus 1 leaves. Because if you give me any unrooted tree, okay, what am I going to look at here? For the unrooted, this, if I give you any unrooted tree, I can convert it on, on, on n minus 1 leaves. I can convert it to a rooted tree on n leaves. If you believe all this, okay, which isn't really that hard if you think about it, you get a recurrence relation, okay, that tells you how many unrooted trees there are. Let's go boom, boom. Okay, the number of rooted trees is 2n minus 3 times the number of unrooted ones. The number of rooted ones with n leaves, okay, is equal to the number of unrooted ones with n minus plus 1 leaves. Here you've got two recurrences, they have base let claim base things. My claim is using these recurrences you can count the number of rooted or unrooted trees on n vertices. Okay? And basically solving for the rooted trees you get a kind of funny formula like this to tell you how many rooted trees there are on n vertices. Okay? Yes? 
Is it called the Catalan number? The Catalan number is something different. Okay? The Catalan number is the number of, let me just make sure in the context of trees. It is the number of, is it the number of binary search trees? It's the number of trees on n, binary trees on n leaves. The, what is it, the tree? There, there's a set of trees counted by Catalan numbers, and I'm embarrassed to say I'm forgetting what it is. Does anybody remember what that is? It's a possible parenthesis. I mean, there are a couple of different interpretations of it. Catalan numbers count the number of parentheses, the number of triangulations of a convex polygon. They count lots of things, okay? And one thing they count is the number of a certain class of binary trees, okay? And it may be like labeled binary trees on n vertices or something like that, okay? It's the number of binaries. Full binary trees on n plus one, n plus one vertices. No. D, which means vertices. Okay. Anyway, that's a set of trees. This is not the Catalan numbers. Okay. But it is both of them are exponential. Okay. Any questions here? So what's the what's the punchline here? If you have ten species, there are two million unrooted trees. Okay? If you have 20 species, you've got 2 to the 20th, 2 times 10 to the 20th rooted trees. So there are a large number of trees is the important point. So if you have a small number of species, you might hope to say, let's try all possible topologies, score that topology based on how good it is, okay, and pick the best tree. It should be clear that it is hopeless to search through all possible trees in general, okay? And so the punchline is that, there, that um, you need to use algorithms to find the best, the best tree by some measure, okay? Algorithm or a heuristic, okay? You're not going to search through all of them, okay? And in fact, I'll tell you, most NP, uh, tree reconstruction problems, the interesting ones, tend to be NP-complete. So in general, you've got a problem here, okay? Any questions? A lot of trees, you want to find the right one, okay? Any questions? So why is the business of reconstructing phylogenic trees a hard problem? Okay, I think we've hit on a lot of the different points here. One is that, uh, as we talked about, I just mentioned, once you define what an optimal tree is, you have to define what the best tree is in a careful manner. If you define it in a not so careful manner, you often get an NP-complete problem, and that then becomes hopeless to try to reconstruct the right tree. Does everybody get that idea? Note also that there is an idea of a right tree here. This is one thing that's, that's different than clustering problems, right? In general, in data clustering, you had a bunch of data. You said cluster it and see what happened, right? And it's not clear that there is a quote-unquote right answer. In principle, in an evolutionary process, there is a right answer, right? Does everybody see that? We have a bunch of species. They came from someplace. They got here in a certain way, okay? So more so than approximations, in principle, when you're doing tree reconstruction, you really want to have the right answer, okay? And that causes a little tension in what we're doing here, okay? Close isn't really, in principle, good enough, okay? But we have a problem that if you define what a tree is, okay, in a, in a, in a realistic manner, you often get an NP-complete problem out of it. And, you know, finding the act, that means you can't find the optimal answer. Any questions? One other problem that comes up is that, uh, that in this world, you have scholars that have lots of opinions, okay? So the kind of people who reconstruct phylogenic trees typically have some kind of a theory in their mind as to how this worked, right? You can kind of imagine if you are a scholar who has studied languages, okay? You have a sense as to how languages evolved, right? And you may even have a pet theory. I think that Basque came from the French, okay? 
some other scholar may have a belief that Basque came from the Spanish, right? Historically, these kind of scholars spend a lot of time arguing with each other because there's often very little evidence here, okay, and fairly deep-seated beliefs, beliefs. So the world of reconstructing evolution gets a lot of fighting and anger, more so than computer scientists are used to dealing with, okay? You have scholars with strong opinions. And historically, the way that the tree construction business went is I have an opinion, I collect data, I run algorithms until I find one that produces a tree that is like what I think it should be, okay? At that point, I publish this tree as truth, okay? And then I get prepared to argue with somebody else, okay? Any questions about that? So this makes it a different world, okay, is that than, than we're used to working with, okay? But in principle, there is a true answer, and science is trying to get to that true answer. Any questions? The other thing that makes it complicated is that the data is inherently, you know, um, in most cases, very noisy, okay, often error prone and hard to interpret. Let's think about which one of these cases might we want to think about. Let's say, like we were talking about uh, the, you know, let, let, let's which, pick, let's say pick, pick one of the applications we had, okay. Let's say. I don't know, let's say species, okay, we're trying to interpret species. If we're trying to construct feature data on species, we want to know what are interesting features that are hard to evolve. What might be features of species that are hard to evolve? Okay, if we don't want them to evolve many times, right? A good example might be flight, right? It's hard to imagine how you evolve to fly, right? But if you believe that, then birds and insects should have a common ancestor, right? That flies and birds should have a common ancestor, and ants and something else should have a common ancestor, right? And that's obviously a silly thing, right? So once you start trying to define these features, you can create data that is, you know, um, you know, that is hard to interpret. It's often noisy. There's something, a flying squirrel. Someone was talking to me about flying squirrels before. Does a flying squirrel fly? No. You say no. Does anybody here say I think a flying squirrel flies? The guy who named the flying squirrel must have thought it flew, right? <laughs> so the claim is for some of these things, there is some level of interpretation involved. And there's some noise at the level of features, right? And of course, you have the problem that because the problems are NP-complete and because people are clever at designing algorithms, there are lots of different tree reconstruction algorithms that have been proposed, okay, heuristics. And the problem is on any data set, they will give you different, tre different trees, okay? And so somehow from this kind of world, we want to try to figure out the ground truth, which species came from which species. Any questions about that? Okay. So you should know why, understand why it's important, you should understand why it's hard, and you should understand the data that why we think it might, you know, might be possible to learn something about this. Any questions? Okay, good. So if I want to talk about these algorithmic problems, I think um, the flavor of this problem I want to claim. Okay, if, you say, if you look at, let's say, the classic algorithm problems, which one looks most like phylogenic tree reconstruction? Okay? It's a problem that I would say is called in graphs the problem of reconstructing the optimal Steiner tree. What is the Steiner tree problem? In principle, it would be if I give you a set of points, okay, I want to connect them by a tree using as little wire as possible. That is the minimum Steiner tree problem, okay? But many of you are saying, wait a second, I've heard that problem by a different name. What problem have you heard of? Minimum spanning tree. What is the difference between these two, okay? What, what was it? Well, it's a question of whether you can add vertices, okay? If we think about the case of three vertices in an equilateral triangle, right? The minimum spanning tree is easy to find, right? It's kachunk, kachunk, right? If you want to reconnect these things with the smallest amount of wire, 
In fact, if you build a point in the center, okay, this tree is going to be, the red tree, is going to be something smaller than the original tree. Okay, I think if the length of this tree, if this tree was, the blue tree was two, okay, uh, the blue tree was two, I think that the red tree, if I remember correct, is something like square root of three over two. Okay? Is that right? I think, um, something, anyway, it works out to be something like two versus 1.77 or something like that. Okay? So what makes minimum spanning tree is an easy problem, right? You all know we talked about it in clustering. We talked about it in all these kinds of things. That is where you're trying, where you're given the vertices and demand that you connect all the vertices, right? In minimum Steiner tree in the plane, you're given the leaf nodes, and you have to figure out where the intermediate nodes are, right? And in a graph problem, maybe you're given a graph which has a lot of possible intermediate nodes, right? These are connected in some way. The minimum Steiner problem in graph says, what is the smallest spanning tree? tree that connects all the leaves, okay, but it doesn't have to connect all the vertices. Does everybody see that? The blue here would be a Steiner tree in the red graph. It doesn't use all the vertices, okay, but finding what is the subset of vertices that you need to use is all what makes the tree reconstruction problem hard, right? And so Steiner tree captures the problem of spanning tree, of, of, of phylogenetic re tree reconstruction, as well as we can do. Any questions about that? Okay. In Steiner tree, you have to use all the, you're given a certain set of leaves or sites that you care about, and you want to connect them using as little wire as possible, but you don't have to use all, any, all the other vertices. Does everybody get that idea? That's really what the difference is. If you have to use all the vertices, it's minimum spanning tree, and it's easy. If you only want to have to use the ones that are the target ones, then it becomes minimum Steiner tree, and it's a hard problem. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions about tree reconstruction or anything like that? You're saying, wait a second, why can't I just take the graph, find the minimum spanning tree of it, okay, and then delete the parts that I don't care about. That's right now what you're saying. The reason why you can't do it is minimum Steiner tree is entry complete and minimum spanning tree is polynomial, right? So if you could do it, okay, you have a fast algorithm for solving minimum Steiner tree, you're famous. That's an argument that you can't do it. <laughs> A better argument is that, that you give me an algorithm for how you're going to cut, how you're going to delete these things away, and I'll show you a counterexample. That's really, that's the right, that's, that's the right answer here. The problem is that, you know, somehow, you know, the minimum 